Hey, everybody. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Welcome if you're in the room. I see some people out here. Welcome. Glad you're here. <sighs> what a day, huh? It's a beautiful morning. Wow. How many of you like the snow? Hey, look, see, people are still raising their hands. The <laughs> Hard snow to believe. Was that Hard to believe. You but didn't, you didn't like it? I know in the springtime, if you don't like the snow, just wait, because it's going to be gone by the end of the day. <laughs> Thankfully. I mean, well, I, yeah. But man, weren't the mountains beautiful? I know you drive in right down yes, 34. It's a, it's a great view. And it was oh. very snowy here Thursday. Next day it was gone. There'll be snow tomorrow, but it'll be 70 by Friday. So, hey, spring in Colorado. Hey, hey. It's beautiful, though. And I'm not complaining. Right? I mean, the beauty of the snow <laughs> yes. up there. Oh, and with it's this, just, with I love sun. it. I love it when there's like wind and clouds coming off the backside. And you see the. And you can yeah. just see it coming up over the peaks. Yeah. Beautiful. It is very, very beautiful. Beautiful. Very, very beautiful. beautiful. Yes. So, speaking of beautiful. Yes. How's and that you know, for a I was going to say, and I have taken lots of pictures just from my own backyard. Okay. And yes. I post it and I brag about just. How and you have turkeys is. that live next door, right? We do have I mean, turkeys. And I'm pheasants. not talking like character qualities. Well, I have turkeys that live in my house. <laughs> 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 but the wild turkeys that live outside Yeah, they just come well. up the street, don't they? Mm -hmm. Every day they make a path. They, they cross the road and go out. And then at sunset, wow. they come back. Oh, and we've seen turkeys. pheasants as well. I don't know if I should say that because I don't want people to hunt them. But um, there Sorry. have been pheasants as well. I use pheasant tails because I tie flies. Okay. And one of the best Colorado flies is called a pheasant tail. And you use a pheasant. They're very beautiful animals. Yeah, so the next time a pheasant goes by, grab a tail feather I for can't. me. I can't. They're too pretty. You only <laughs> take one. Oh. No, <laughs> beautiful places. So beautiful places. We actually places. have a picture, right? Yes, I've been very fortunate to be in some of the most beautiful places, and Colorado being one of them, all over the world, from Greece yeah. to Haiti to Ethiopia to Mexico to Romania to Moldova. Um, Whoa. Really, just all Your over the world. Your passport must be this thick. I, I, I have, I'm on my second passport. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, but I have a picture of from one of the most gorgeous sunsets, and I could take pictures here every day, but the picture is from the Philippines. Yes, um, I think we have a copy of it. Yeah, my sister-in-law lived here. Oh, look. Both of my, my niece and nephew were born in the Philippines. Um, but at this island, wow. every day you could take pictures, and it was just so gorgeous. Uh. Um, Micah, uh, my daughter, went scuba diving there, and mm. the most beautiful blue starfish in her hand ever. I mean... Blue. Blue, a blue, a blue I can't even describe the blue. You know, it's wow. really just so beautiful. Wow. But yeah, I just, the pictures don't even do it justice. No, you, you can't. Know? Sunset pictures are just, yeah. you know, if you could yeah. put it up on your wall like 10, 12 feet mm -hmm. wide, you'd do. Yeah. I, I have one. This Show, is a yeah, picture me of, of me with my two grandkids when okay. we visited the Seychelles Islands. Okay. This was like four years ago. And uh, again, the beautiful blue ocean. Mm -hmm. The Seychelles Islands are off the west coast of Africa. Okay, yes. And our Kids are living in Africa, so we visited them, and then we flew out for sp their spring break yeah. to the Seychelles Islands and yeah. uh, snorkeling. We went snorkeling yeah. out in this water. You could just swim out warm. Oh, but the colors of fish. There's little reefs out there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. unbelievable, beautiful. Yes. But that color, that water. The water, just like, yeah, just so clear. Yeah. <gasps> so beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Again, this is so great. Just so great. And Dennis, we have a lot of events coming up here we that we do. want to tell people we about. Do. One of them being the Partners in Hope block party and barbecue. barbecue and this is a new event that maybe people don't really know about yeah. like what to expect yeah I, in fact i was talking to people between the services and they said well what's what's this i heard about this block party i want to yeah. come but what is it exactly exactly yeah so what is it so um i this is an event where we want to there's a silent auction where people are donating items for people to bid on but also most importantly for people to find out of local partners that we have, we come together that are doing great work, work. in our community. Yeah. And they get to talk about what they do and people get to hear the wonderful things that are going on in our Yeah, in our and community. how you could get involved with some yes. of these. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be on the East Patio. Outside. Picture that. Yes. So it's safe. We'll keep people apart. You Fun can activities sit with your for the kids. Kids stuff going on, yes. like face painting and the, the playgrounds out there. And food. Great food. food. What kind of food, Wendy? Um, Some smoked barbecue, like pulled pork, maybe some brisket, by a special someone named Ryan Howell. Oh, you know him. I know him very well. <laughs> yeah. um, and 
So he's bringing, he's, he's doing that for this event yes. for free. And, and it is Gwen really Sturgis's good. famous baked beans. Oh, and yes. And a big veggie tray. Nice. And drinks and all kinds of. And I would assume that this event would cost um, lots of money to get in. $25 ticket. But it's free. But it's free for If you sign up before May 1st. Okay, all right. Because the event's on May 1st from oh, 430 to 630. <laughs> so after May 1st, it's going to cost money. But so people just need to reserve a ticket. Yep. That's all they have to do. Go online, crossroadscolorado.com slash hope. Yeah. And you can sign up. You can donate an item to the silent auction. Right. You can help us. Be, you could be on the food team, the setup team. We yeah. can still use people to help. Yep. So again, all of that's on that website, crossroadscolorado.com slash hope. Hope. And they can check out these items that are for auction on the Orange Dots of Hope Facebook group. Yes. Go on there and look at them. That, that way they can be prepared for items they want to bid, bid on, on and get in a bidding war with someone. Yeah, like me. Right? Because there, there, there is a fishing trip there is out a there fishing trip. that they could get into a bidding yep. war. But So go on there, check that out. We have a great morning ahead of us. Yes, we do. Glad you're here. Well, thank you for joining us here at Crossroads or online. We're so glad that you're with us this morning. I want to invite you to stand. We're going to start by singing together.
a mercy that is healing and restoring this world. Yes, we affirm that God has judged the world through the life of Jesus, and we therefore believe that the judgment of God is love. Because of this, we can with confidence bring our wounds and wounding, our victories and successes, our good days and our bad days. We know that every part of us is sacred to our encounter with the love that keeps no record wrong. Today, you are invited to open your heart and experience the grace and mercy of God that are just too good to be true. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our come on, sing. Nothing should be impossible. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Thank you. Thank you for being here. You can have a seat. Wave to people. Turn around. Say hello. If you're in the room, if you're watching online, thanks for joining us on this fabulous Colorado spring morning. I'm Dennis and... And I am Wendy and I would like to say hello to everyone as well. I hope everyone is having a great weekend. As you came into the room, you should have received a program. And if you're watching online, you should see a link pinned in the comments section. Do me a favor, if you're in the room, get that Connect card out. And if you are online, click that link to find your digital Connect card. If you are a regular attender, just put your name and email address. And if this is your first or second time, here, welcome, and um, just put as much information on there as you feel comfortable, and you can check that box, new here. Um, on the back of that Connect card, you will see some next steps and some easy ways to get some questions answered or tell us your prayer requests. Hang on to those cards until the end of our gathering today, or click Submit, and you can drop those off in the orange kiosk in the back of the auditorium. And one of the boxes today under Connect With Us says CASA, Court Appointed Special Advocates of Larimer County. And this is one of our new Partners in Hope uh, organizations that we're partnering with. And what, what this is, is CASA is a national organization that recruits, screens, and trains community volunteers who will be an advocate for children who are in the court system, children that have experienced neglect or abuse. And in Larimer County, this staggered me actually. There are 600 children just in our county that are in the court system because of neglect or abuse. And so a, a, a warm, friendly, caring person comes alongside them and walks through that whole process with that child. Right now, we only have 300 volunteers and 600 kids. So uh, we're going to be introducing you to this organization both here and at, uh, at Crossroads next weekend especially, and then at the block party mm -hmm. that's coming up. So, and we're having a seminar 
uh, for people who are interested. So if you check that box, the CASA box, we'll send you a link to the seminar that's going to happen on April 28th. Yeah, and what a really great organization. We'd also like to invite you to our Partners in Hope Block Party and Barbecue on Saturday, May 1st at 4.30 yes. p.m. Dennis and I will yes, both we be want there. You to come. And um, you'll learn more about our vision for peacemaking and our outreach in the Loveland community and really around the world. You'll have a chance to meet some of our current partners like CASA that Dennis just mentioned. Um, there will be food, music, fun activities food. for kids. Food, what kind of food, Wendy? You know, I did hear Anything? that a special someone named Ryan Howell is going to be making some smoked brisket, pulled pork maybe. So he's going to be smoking pork instead of smoking that other stuff that he... You um, get here in that's, Colorado. That's, yeah. So you, that is, this event is no, he doesn't, free, he doesn't. Dennis. He's so a Traeger. <laughs> well, it is free. You do want to make sure that you reserve your ticket at crossroadscolorado.com slash hope. Yeah. Don't right. don't miss it. It's going to be fun. There's a silent auction. Yes. Um, great food stuff for the kids. Right. They could, uh, you know, auction off an item to go fly fishing with you, Dennis, hiking with Ryan. Lots yes. of great items. Yeah. There. There's like 30 things there. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, if you want to find the list of auction items, go on our Crossroads Orange Dots of Hope Facebook page. Yep. And if you're not on it, join it. You do want to join you it. There's join lots, it. Of, uh, lots of things listed there. Uh, one other thing I just want to mention is that uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody who gives financially to, to this, this community we call Crossroads. Because it does so much good. And there's lots of ways to give. You're probably familiar with them. You can drop it in that envelope in a kiosk at the back of the room as you leave today. You can give online. You can give through Venmo. Um, we've created every way you could possibly give <laughs> so to make it simple and easy. So uh, we appreciate that because the, the money goes to fuel and support what it is that we're about as a church, whether it's kids camp, kids ministries that are going on, our family ministries, our partners in hope. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for being generous. And Dennis, I think all of us have dealt with shame and pain over the past, over who we were. And this morning, we want to be thankful that we serve a God who calls us to let go of our past. And God takes away our shame. This song calls us to be open to growth and change as we continue to learn.
we thank you for the new wine that you are bringing out of us each and every day. God, we praise you that we can bring our understandings and our misunderstandings and we can just lay them down and know that you are bigger than all of that. So God, we come here today with ears to hear what you have to lay on our hearts this morning. God, we love you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome. My name is Isaac Bartholomew, and I'm the pastor of Family Ministries here at Crossroads. I'm glad you are all here with us. And uh, up up here with me is Amber Conant. And Amber is one of our key leaders and volunteers in Family Ministries and has been around the church for a bit, her and her family. So Amber, talk to us about your journey here at Crossroads and how you've ended up serving in Family Ministries as a volunteer leader. Yeah, so this is um, our 13 years here at Crossroads. 13. Yeah. Lucky number 13. That's right. That's right. Um, so we started uh, We started with putting Aubrey in when she was six months old, and she's just continued through the program. She actually now is doing student ministries on Thursdays out she's at the student center. Helping out out there a lot. A lot of fun, actually. Yeah, she is. She does check in here for us on Sundays. And then Jackson, my son, he does the build program, which is upstairs for kindergartners through fifth graders on Sundays. Yeah. And, uh, and also, your husband, Corey, he helps out a bit sometimes with, with uh, in family ministries. What's he doing with us? Yeah, he does. He does. Um, we try to rotate every other Thursday. One of us will be here. Um, so he has crazy shift work that he does. So Yeah, and he comes and hangs out with the students on Thursday night. A lot of fun. Uh, so you all are involved in the in the family ministry. <laughs> yeah, Crossroads. yeah. Um, but, you know, so you can be involved and it's easy. You know, if anybody wants to volunteer, for sure, there's lots of ways to do that. But mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. why, Amber, why are you and your family so, uh, dare I say, entrenched or uh, you're here every week, multiple services, doing a lot for family ministries? Why? Um, you know, it started when the kids were young. Uh, they always wanted to come to church, so it was easy. It was easy to get them here. And so we were here. So we thought, if we're here, why wouldn't we help? Um, we always need help. The church always needs volunteers. And so it was just easy to insert ourselves. And um, we, we've we loved it. We have helped out with kids camps. And it's just been easy to help out with the kids. And even when it's not my kids, it's easy to help out other kids. So. It's a lot of fun to see the impact that you're making uh, in not just, you know, your kids' lives by being involved in family ministry, but we have loads of families that come through mm-hmm. and doing parts. So talk to me a little bit about that. What is the impact that you're seeing or what are some stories or fun things that you're seeing within family ministries? Yeah, so we have one family and they have um, some boys and they're so excited to get up on Sunday mornings, get dressed as fast as they can, eat breakfast as fast as they can. And they always have to come to the nine o'clock service because they're so excited. They just cannot wait for 11. It's just too far out. They've got to get here at nine. Too far. So all of you here at the 11, uh, you, they wouldn't make it that long. So uh, yeah, that, that is a lot of fun. And we see these families, they're not the only ones that, that come through and they just have enjoyed being a part of family ministry for their kids. And uh, so we have that on Sunday mornings. We have, we, she mentioned, Amber just mentioned a couple of different programs that we have available. We have uh, CK groups, our small group format for kids ministry that happen on Sunday morning, whether it's from birth to five years old, we have that, we call that GROW. The GROW hallway is this lower hallway on the other side of the atrium. And then we have kindergarten through fifth grade upstairs, we call that BUILD also on Sunday mornings at both services. And then on Thursday evenings, we have our middle school and high school ministry called Shift, our student ministry on Thursday nights. And that's happening out in the student center. And it's a blast. And yes, Amber is coming over occasionally with Corey there. And, and it's just fun to watch our these volunteers build incredible relationships with, with kids and students. And it's a, been a lot of fun. And we have, we have some opportunities for people to serve uh, and, and being a part of what's going on in family ministries. Amber, what would you say to that? If somebody is in the audience thinking, I'd like maybe get involved with helping out with family ministries, but I'm not sure if I'm ready. Yeah. What would you say to that? Yeah, no, I'd say come on over. Um, we don't need the perfect person. We're just looking for someone. Come on well, in. that cuts us out. Yeah, I know. I'm but they kidding. took us, so. Yeah, well, they did take I us. Mean, We're not perfect, so that right. works out. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, come on, come upstairs, take a peek in the classroom. Um, we will email you the leader guide throughout the week. And so you can take a peek at that before you come in. We'll have a classroom all set up and ready for you to go. We try to make it as easy as possible so that you don't have to take a bunch of time out of your week to pre-plan for everything. Um, so we really do try to make it as easy as possible for you. 
Yeah, and if you'd like to volunteer and be involved with kids, but maybe you don't want to work directly with kids, we have other things that you can do throughout the week as well, uh, because we do a lot of setup during the week to get ready for the weekend. So if you want to be kind of behind the scenes, you could help out with that. And if that was the case, what days should they come, Amber, do you think? Maybe like Tuesdays when you're here? Yeah, that would be great. (laughs) (laughs) Come hang out, or if you want, you know, we we can send stuff to you to, to put together our little kits and things like that as well. So lots of ways to get involved. Uh, And if you are interested in being more involved in family ministries, on the back of your Connect card, there's a checkbox. Just simply check that box and we'll send you the information this week. I'll be in touch with you about ways that you can be involved in all of the different family ministries, whether it's, you know, holding babies in the nursery to hanging out with high schoolers on Thursday night. So uh, in, in anything in between and all kinds of fun to be had there. So if you'd be interested, you can do that. Or if you have kids that you want to know more about what's happening in family ministry and get them plugged in, you can also, there's a box to check for that as well. And we'll be in touch with you as well. So with that, uh, would you join me in a word of prayer for our team, this incredible volunteer team that we have available in family ministries? God, thank you for today and for the opportunity we have to talk about what you're doing um, in these kids that are coming up, this next generation of incredible people that we care so much about. And God, I just ask that you would be with us and with people like Amber, who have given so much time and energy and effort to creating experiences for kids to know you just a little bit better. God, thank you for our time. It's your name we pray. Amen. Welcome to the weekend. I'm feeling so encouraged seeing vaccination rates going up and watching the weather getting nicer all the time. I'm proud that our network continues to stay safe by offering online experiences and by wearing masks and staying spread out at our in-person gatherings. We are committed to helping Larimer County move in the right direction. I'm Jessica and here's what you need to know this week. We are very excited to introduce a new ministry at Crossroads called Partners in Hope. We have a vision to accelerate peacemaking from Loveland to the furthest parts of the earth by investing into ministries, programs, and trips aimed at rewriting the five unacceptable truths of our world. Spiritual emptiness, poverty, illiteracy, fear of the other, and modern day slavery. With hearts aching, we continue to see these unacceptable truths persist in our world and our nation. In this past week, we can see this fear of the other manifest in continued culture war now focused against transgender people, mass shootings in multiple states, and another death of a person of color at the hands of law enforcement, resulting in more violence and rioting in the streets. The human story continues to be a tale of accelatory violence. Now, as always, we need the peacemaking path of Jesus. Our world needs individuals and organizations grounded in a commitment to God's vision of distributive justice for all people, actively bringing the light of hope into the darkness of violence and oppression. We need Partners in Hope. And over the next 10 years, our Partners in Hope strategy will provide opportunities for all of us to get engaged and educated in rewriting these unacceptable truths both locally and globally. As a network of generous peacemakers, we're excited to raise funds and award grants to individuals and organizations doing this peacemaking work in our own community and beyond. We are excited in the days ahead to offer trips to explore how God is working through parts of our world and through our partners. So if you are in Northern Colorado, Don't miss this inaugural Partners in Hope block party and barbecue where you can meet some of our current partners. I love our network of generous peacemakers. Thank you for believing in and participating in this vision. Have a great week.
right, give him a big hand. Thank you. Thanks for being here. What a great song. What a great song. Good morning. My name is Ryan. I'm the lead pastor here at Crossroads. It's great to have you. If you're a guest, welcome. Thank you for being a part of today. If you're a guest this morning, whether you're tuning in online or you're in the room, I just want you to know it's going to be a little longer than usual today. So just hang in there, all right? Or come back next week. It'll be shorter, I promise. Uh, but we're going to try and get through this kind of quick. But it's a big topic today, and it's an important topic today in this series of mistaken identity. As you think about that song and the lyric of that song that says, it, it may be too good to be understood, but it's not too good to be true. Is this the vision of God that you have? Is it too good to be true? Could you mark that? Could you think about your faith that way? For a long time in my life, uh, I couldn't have sung that song and thought about God in that way. I could in some respects. I could think about it. But there was always this, there was always this hint of fear. There was always this overlying uh, understanding that while, while, yes, God is too good to be true, but God is really just too good to be true for those of us that get it right. For those of us that maybe get it wrong or were born in a z- different zip code in a different area of the country with different faith understandings, then... Yeah, no, not so good for you. Because a lot of us have this kind of understanding and this idea and this framework for God that I like to call FBI God. Do y'all know FBI God? FBI God, live PD God, cops God. Now, if you're in law enforcement, if you're a FBI officer, I don't mean to offend you. It's just my spiritual gift. Uh, but this is the best analogy I can use. Uh, to describe this idea that God is constantly on the lookout, right? God is that, that being that sits on the side of the road, proverbially, just waiting to catch you speeding. And God lights the sirens up, has been watching you, spying on you, taking notes, shows up and uh, gives you the ticket and says, we'll see you in court. Judge wants to talk to you. Right? And, and so we grow up or we experience or we live a life of faith, always kind of looking over our shoulder, right? always wondering, when does this God show up? And did I do something wrong? Becomes a, a question that marks kind of this spirituality in our lives. Uh, I think a lot of us tuning in out in the forward, we've, we've experienced this. And in this experience of a God that is angry, Uh, uh, of God that is looking to bring judgment, a God that is so pure and so holy, can't stand to be around you, uh, has been around for a long time, and it finds itself in lots of different expressions of Christianity. Predominantly, and one of the most famous expressions of this view of God is from a guy named Jonathan Edwards. Anybody ever heard of a guy named Jonathan Edwards? That's right. The history is going to start back in 1741 today. We're going to walk through about 300 years. How's that sound? Well, I promise it'll get fast. It'll go faster. But Jonathan Edwards, uh, a preacher in New England. Now, I I kind of spent 20 years of my life in in New England, and there's a few things you don't do if you're a preacher in New England. Uh, You don't talk bad about the Red Sox. You just don't do that. Uh, You don't don't talk bad about Tom Brady uh, or the Pats. You don't do that either, although I did a little bit of that. But one thing you definitely don't do if you're from New England is talk bad about Jonathan Edwards. Uh, Jonathan, you just don't mess with him. Like, like spirituality in America, like our faith is just grounded in Jonathan Edwards. This is the funniest thing to me. So, uh, and as I, I want to read to you some uh, parts of probably his most famous sermon, which is unfortunate because I would never want to be judged by one sermon. And if I did have to be judged by one sermon, I would want to be the one to pick it, not history, right? Um, and so I just want to pull this out because it is a very popular and famous sermon called Sinner in the Hands of an Angry God. Anybody ever heard of this? If you're in the room, you can slip your hand up if you've ever heard of ser- Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. This is actually seen as a piece of American literature that literature courses study and still read because of its imagery, the way he writes this sermon. Uh, and and this, is the, this is really at its truest sense, like FBI, CIA, spy God, right? Uh, angry God. This is what uh, he says. The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. He is of purer eyes than to bear to have you in his sight. You are 10,000 times so abominable in his eyes as the most hateful venomous serpent is in ours. 
Doesn't that sound good? Doesn't that sound good? And, and the truth is, like, that is, that is, in Jonathan Edwards, in this sermon, in a whole brand of Christianity, in a way in which God, that is really an understanding of God. Uh, and it's because God is so pure and right. This is the way God sees you, that God can not And here's the thing. I think many of us, many of us in the room, many of, who are tuning in line, maybe you've had this, you're going to have this talk, like, forwarded to you because you had a conversation with a friend and they said, you've got to hear this. Like, many of us understand the pain because we've experienced the trauma of this FBI spirituality. And I have no other word for it other than it is a type of trauma. And I say that many of us have because many of us come from and are a part of and have been a part of what I would call like historically fundamentalist heritage Christianity. It's just a part of the American church. Uh, and, and, it, and it stems back from the first great awakening. It stems back from that whole movement. But over these last 50 years, the, the Christian church, primarily the American church, has had this steady diet and weird thirst and longing for this kind of violent, vengeful Jesus. This Jesus of uh, rapture theology where one day Jesus is going to show up and then all the good people are going to go away and all the bad people are going to get their dues and then we'll come back, and there'll be this big battle. And, and we just kind of have for 50 years been given a steady diet of this theology, which interestingly enough, the idea of the rapture, if you've ever heard this word before, this idea is very new in terms of the history of Christianity. You can't go back, like you have to go back to 1830 to first ever see anything written about this concept of a rapture. And it comes from a guy named Darby, John Darby. And what he did was he, he saw a passage that he misunderstood in many, in, in a many, 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 many people's opinions, misunderstood one word out of one letter in the New Testament, mistranslated it from the Latin, and has given birth to, in 1830, this huge movement around something called dispensationalism and the rapture. This idea that the way you interpret and understand Jesus' second coming, however you might think about that, is that it's going to be filled with wrath and blood. And basically, the cross didn't work. Nonviolent Jesus didn't work. It had its way. Now violent God shows back up, and just the great cleanup begins. And so this, this happens and starts to emerge in the 19th century. Uh, and then it's the, the, there's this Bible that gets printed towards the end of the 19th century called it's the Darby Bible that deals with these dispensations. And it just begins to take steam. But there's an instance that happens in many of our lifetimes. And I know that some of you in this room, uh, some of these dates, you, you weren't even born during these dates. I wasn't born during some of these dates. My point is, these things that I want to talk about for the next few moments have deeply affected the spiritual imaginations and lives of American Christians. And it really, there's a fundamental work that happened in 1970. A book came out that was called The Late Great Planet Earth. And in The Late Great Planet Earth, the author comes and gives dates for when this rapture is going to happen, produces all kinds of evidence. Here's what it looks like. Here's the things that have to happen. One of the key events that really started to trigger and amp up uh, America's kind of infatuation with end times thinking and infatuation with the rapture was the establishment of Israel as a nation state. And that began to trigger all of this fantasy, really. And so this book gets written, and it begins to take hold of the Christian church in America. In 1972, a movie comes out called A Thief in the Night. Anybody seen A Thief in the Night or A Distant Thunder? Yeah. So this movie, and if I can just pause and give you a little bit of my history in this to understand the trauma I've experienced, is that um, I'm, not a, I'm not a memory person. Like, I don't look back and go, oh. Like, my daughter was asking me this question. Yesterday, our son did his senior pictures. And, and my daughter asked me, like, do you get sad? I'm like, no, not about stuff like that. Like, yeah, good. Get out. You know, that's kind of my... <laughs> I'm proud of you. That's how you say it nicely. We're so proud of you. Like, if you're honest, it's like, yeah, go. I don't, I'm tired of cleaning up after you. Right? <laughs> go make your own mess someplace else, right? No, but like, I'm just not a... Like, some people are scrapbookers. Any scrapbookers in the house? Like, you just love... Yeah, I can't think I'm a scrapper, right? That's awesome. Like, I don't get it. You know, I'm just like... It would never occur to me to like, we should make a picture album of the last vacation. Like, what occurs to me is we got to get back here. Let's save our money. Let's plan. Like, I'm always just thinking about the future, right? So when I think about things in my past that have stuck with me, I, I've, I've learned in my soul care to say, okay, pause and reflect. Why is that 
moment still with you? What is it? And some of those moments that I have uh, from a religious perspective were traumatic. What I've learned is that many of my stories of faith growing up are beautiful, wonderful, I value and treasure them. But I have a handful that have shaped me in a way that have really distorted my ability to rest in a God that is good. And this is one of those moments. I was in fifth grade uh, at a private Christian school, and they showed one of these movies, A Thief in the Night, to me, 10 years old. These movies are based on this idea that a whole bunch of people get taken, a whole bunch of people get left, and if you get left, there's this like antichrist figure who shows up and you have to get what's called the mark of the beast. And if you don't get the mark of the beast, then uh, you basically can't have food or health care or anything like that. And there's a big war. And, and if you don't take the mark of the beast, they're going to chop your head off. And the movie ends showing somebody getting their head chopped off. That's what I was showing at 10 years old. This is God. That stays with you. I'm telling you, you don't leave that behind. <laughs> so, so that ends up like sticking with me pretty hard and, and, and forming uh, experiences in my life where we joke around about it now, like some of us that grew up in that culture about these like rapture scares. But imagine like hearing about this even as a younger child and being like eight, nine, ten years old and, and coming home and not finding anybody and thinking you missed it. You know, and what that does to you as a kid, what that does to your like understanding of God and being able to then, because what triggers it is, oh, I missed it, but then I can tell you the things that I did wrong, you know, over maybe the course of 24 hours and why I missed it. And that like reciprocal pattern happening over and over again, basically for a very long time of foundation and formation of faith. Like, and so in 1972, we start to visualize and show these movies in churches all throughout America. 1972, another book came out by the same author called Satan is Alive and Well on Planet Earth. And so it began to look and see, here's all these things that are happening. 1974, a book came out uh, that dealt with, it was called Armageddon, Oil in the Middle East Crisis. And so the imagination starts to take over of what's happening in the Middle East. This is where the Valley of Megiddo is. And if you look in Revelation, this is where this great giant battle is going to take place, very literalist understandings of this work uh, and, and why it's all tied into oil. And so again, you have all these things happening around us in American culture that's starting to grip the minds and hearts of many, many people. Many, many people. 1974 statistics around people going to church versus today is a different animal. And so our imagination is being taken hold of and being so focused in the grips of what became known as end times thinking. Right? So people begin to really start. Another book comes out called um, The Liberation of Planet Earth uh, in 1976. In 19, and all this stems back to the first book in 1970. It's all tied into this, I think, this very influential book. In 1978, they make a movie of that book, The Late Great Planet Earth. Uh, Orson Welles is a part of this project. And it, and it carries on into the 80s. 83, a book called The Rapture comes out. In 86, there's a book called Combat Faith that basically the premise of this book, if I understand it right, was your faith has to evolve. We need a new kind of faith given what's getting ready to happen. And then in 1989, there's a book called The Road to Holocaust. All this to say, there's all this work happening in the 70s and 80s coming out of the Jesus movement. People are being heavily grounded in and consumed with end times thinking. What does it mean? It's going to happen. Jesus is going to come back. Forget that Paul said that. Forget that the writer of Revelation said that, that it was going to happen really soon. They were all wrong, yet we just don't want to say it for some weird view. That, like, but this is what's happening. And then there's an event that takes place in 1990 that I think just pours gasoline onto the fire of end times thinking. I mean, just, it just begins to explode now. And it is the first Gulf War. So in 1990, we have the first Gulf War. Now, here's why I think this is so pivotal in this whole movement and, and, and how all of a sudden this end time thinking really, really gripped us as Christians in America, and even in a broader conversation around it, you think about it, it enters into politics. Like now we have theology around end times, very little is understanding of Revelation is being, like verses are being quoted and things are being brought up in terms of like our government and our foreign policy. It's just starting to hear, but here's, here's why I think this is it. Because in 1990, when the Persian Gulf War breaks out, Desert Storm, it's the first war in the history of warfare that is being televised 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 24 hours a day, you can tune in live and watch us kill people. 
watch everybody kill people. And I can remember, I was probably in seventh grade at that time, and I can remember going to youth group on Wednesday night. Y'all remember youth group? Anybody remember youth group? If you, if you don't, that's a good sign. It means you're kind of new to faith, uh, and we're not cleaning up so much mess like I have to in my life. But um, maybe you remember it, and, and, and you're grounded. Faith. So we used to, have, Wednesday night, we'd go, and I loved youth group. Like, I, I'm not disparaging that. That was a I mean, it got me through life. I mean, my friends, I mean, it's such a valuable group of people that influenced me. I loved it. But I can remember vividly this Wednesday evening being at the church and, and the war starting and it being projected on a big screen and in uh, one of the rooms, everybody sitting around watching the war break out. And I can remember for the first time ever seeing through night vision, bullets flying through the air, bombs being dropped, explosions, and people watching this, just watching it like it's entertainment. And so that just begins to fuel the imagination. The 90s are filled with this conversation of it. In 1991, they reprint. There's a reprint of the book, Armageddon, Oil, and the Middle East Crisis, right? And it carries on. Then what happens in 1995, which will start to, this will start to hit home with some of us. In 1995, the first book comes out of the Left Behind series, right? And so now we have 12 years of Left Behind books coming out that are taking this end time thinking that stems back to one person in 1830 who mistranslates and misunderstands one word, comes up with the word rapture, and now we're writing a whole series of books taking this very strange book called Revelation in the Bible, a few Bible verses, and turning it into this narrative where the, the hero of these books, and I've never read one book, okay? I've read about, I've read from, but I've never read one of the books. But you have a, a, a hero who is left behind, but at the end of the day, like the end of these books are just filled with, you know, passages about spraying people with Uzis and machine guns that are evil, and they're getting their deserve, what they deserve. So this is like the early 2000s, the late 90s. It's just, it's, there's, they're exploding. You can buy your left behind tie, uh, you can buy your left behind Bible, you can buy your left behind t-shirt, the whole, the whole deal. And here's probably what I think is the most frightening and dangerous and scary and vile that, that like happened in this season is between 1998 and 2004, there were 40 short stories written for teenagers called Left Behind the Kids. Now I say all of this, and that's 2004, right? We can talk about 9-11, we can talk about the rhetoric in foreign policy that takes place based upon, in my, just in my humble opinion, like faulty understandings of, of Scripture verses and things like this. So all of this is affecting American policy. All of this is affecting the Christian church in America. It's affecting political parties, the whole thing. And what, I'm, what I want to get at is that the fruit of this, right? Like if we look at the fruit of this doctrine, we look at the fruit of the way this is being handled, the fruit of the spirit of FBI God is fear, anxiety, exclusion, hatred, harshness, pride. It's not love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, long-suffering. It's just not at all. Like the fruit of this way of seeing and understanding God is, is like antichrist. It's completely against Jesus. And here's why this is important. Because what we see emerging is this, and this truth lays out, that a violent vision of God will inevitably lead to a violent people of God. That if our vision and our thinking about God is that God will, will eventually send billions and billions of people to eternal damnation in the fiery pits of a literal hell, we have no problems getting that program started earlier. We don't, we just, we, we, we don't, we have, we can justify it. So the vision of God creates a the violent vision of God will create a violent people of God. And here's the thing, like the Bible presents us with two visions of God. <laughs> and this is where the struggle is. There are plenty of verses in the Bible that give us God as Zeus, that paint God as Zeus, a violent moral monster filled with wrath. They're, they're there. And when I say the Bible, I don't mean the Old Testament. So some of you want to go, well, yeah, that was the Old Testament. No, I'm telling you, it's the whole thing. And you don't want to be here for an hour and a half, so I can't just give you 25,000 of these verses. But here's the deal. It's there. And I want to talk about these two images that are within the Bible, both Old and New Testament. So you go to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 15, 3, and you can read about what God tells the Israelites to do to the Amalekites, a group of people that bottom line is they own land, 
It's time to dispossess that land. The text is justifying why this is happening. But here's what it says. Go and strike Amalek and completely destroy everything that he has and do not spare him. This is God speaking. But put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. There is that image of the violent God. And we have to address this. It's there. It's there. I, it's funny, I don't hear a whole lot of people that are kind of single-issue folks around abortion and, you know, uh, right to life ever quote this verse for a biblical view on abortion. We don't ever go, oh, oh this is what the Bible says about abortion, but we don't ever quote this verse because we know this is atrocious. This is horrible. That is absolutely awful. We get it. Like, and, and there is that argument that would say, well, you know, it's God. And if God says it's okay, then it's okay. If God does it, then it's moral. Okay, well, but what if God is telling you to do something that we now would look at and go, that is so immoral and monstrous. In Numbers 31, in the case of the Midianites, God tells through Moses to the Israelites, go destroy all the Midianites. Put them under what's called the ban, which is a technical term, which basically is genocide. Destroy them all. They cannot continue to exist. So they go and the generals and the leaders of the army are merciful, <laughs> merciful, and they show back up, and Moses gets angry at them because they haven't killed the women. So this is what Moses says in Numbers 31. So you spared all the women? He says, now, go therefore and kill every male among the children and kill every woman who has had sexual relations with a man but you may spare for yourselves all the girls who have not had sexual relations. So we say, well, if God says it, if God kills, it's okay because God is morally like outside of ourselves, that's fine. But what, when, what about when God says, okay, keep for yourselves the young virginal teenagers so that you can have your own slaves and sex slaves and do what you want with them and marry them, whatever. Like we know that's repugnant. We know that that's not, but that's the picture, the vision that's given to us of God. You know, well, but again, you're saying, well, Ryan, that's all Old Testament stuff. No, it's not. If, I mean, we can go to Revelation and just like, boom, and put our finger down and find it, you know. But let's look at Paul. Ephesians 5, 6, Paul says, let no one deceive you with empty arguments, for because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the disobedient. Who in the room would consider yourself a disobedient person at some time in your life? Anybody? Yeah, okay, welcome to the club, right? Well, you have to look forward to the wrath of God, you know. Or you know, you, we have passages Colossians, which, by the way, both Ephesians and Colossians, it does matter, are, are, like most scholars would say, these are probably not authentic Paul letters. When you look at the authentic Pauline letters, you have a very different Paul than you see in some of these other letters. Not that they're not beautiful and wonderful and we don't gain from them, but it's just an important side note. Colossians 3, Paul says, the writer says, put to death then the parts of you that are earthly, immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and the greed that is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming upon the disobedient. There it is, that wrath of God. You look in Revelation, it's the wrath of God, it's the blood, it's everything, it's Armageddon. And this is the Zeus vision we get, right? And this is the picture we're given. And it's, it's all throughout the pages of Scripture. But here's the good news, Right? Maybe. There's, a, there's another vision of God all throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. This isn't, oh, the Old Testament, bad, angry, grumpy, have a snicker God. New Testament, wonderful, happy Jesus God, right? This is everywhere, right? There are plenty of verses in the Bible that paint God, depict God as a father, this God of nonviolent, merciful, pursuing us with love. Psalm 86, 15 says, But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in mercy and truth, except for the Amalekites. <laughs> Unless you're one of those teenagers who was taken as spoil. I mean, it says this, this beautiful picture of God's mercy is Psalm 145 again. It says, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. Listen to this. The Lord is good to, what's the word? All. All. You know, except the Midianites, <laughs> except the Amalekites, right? Except those, those, those women, those, those infants that are, ha happened to have been born in the land that we wanted. But this was, it's right there. All over, it's right there. And Jesus, I mean, 
more than any other place, gives us this vision of the Father, gives us this vision of mercy. And, and I think one of the best places we see it is Luke 15, where Jesus tells these three stories. Uh, the story of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost sons. The lost coin, woman has one coin, loses it, sweeps everywhere, clears it, finds it, throws a big party. The lost sheep, one, leaves, 99, go out, find sheep, bring it back, put it on your arms, big celebration. The two lost sons are oftentimes called the parable of the prodigal son, right? What happens to the parable of the prodigal son? A father has two sons it starts off with. And one son, the younger son, he wants, his, he wants his fair share now. He says, I've got life to live. I don't fit into this household. It's not my jam. Come on, dad. Give me my stuff. Let me go. It's all good. And dad says, okay, here you go. You can have everything. You take it to shores. And he goes and he goes. And he parties. He has a good time. He buys friends. He just enjoys life. And he finds himself broke, empty. The famine comes in. He's got to serve the pigs, feed the pigs. It's not going so well for him. He says, I know what I'll do. Even my father's servants are treated better than this. I'll go and I'll say, Father, I've sinned against you and God. If you'll just have me back as your servant and surely my father take me. So he goes off and here's what happens. That Jesus tells us the story it goes, he says in verse 19, while he was still a long way off, the son, the first son that was off, while he was a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was filled with judgment and wrath and, and no, he's filled with compassion, and he runs to his son, embraces him, and kisses him. The son tries to give him his manipulative speech. I have got all the right words, and he's like, oh, be quiet. Be quiet. Come on. And they put the coat on him, and they give him the ring, and they throw the big party, and it's wonderful. And while this party's going on, the other son is out in the field. He's coming in from working, and he hears all the noise, and he asks one of the servants, what's going on? What's going on? And the servant says, oh, you didn't hear the good news. Your brother is back. Your father's thrown this big party, slaughtered the calf, where everybody's drinking. It's awesome. Come on in. And the text says that Jesus tells, says that this son, the older one, he got very angry, and he wouldn't go back into the house. And so the father said, fine, stay out. I don't even want you in here. That's your attitude towards your... No, what does the father do? He goes out and he pleads with the other lost son. It's, everybody's lost in the story, right? And it's the father going out, the father going out. says, no, come in, come in. And he pleads with him and he pleads with him. He says, everything I have is yours, but your brother was dead and now he's alive. He was lost and now he's found. Come in. And so we get this second vision painted all throughout the Bible of this God. And it's painted and depicted beautifully this story in Rembrandt's painting, The Return of the Prodigal Son. We have this father hovering over this disheveled, broken, sandals are broken, the clothes are, his, his hair is shaved in shame and scorn. And you have the household, that all I have it all together, but you have the father embracing, look of compassion and mercy. And so Jesus reveals in the ultimate in his ultimate, like, beautiful story and throughout his whole life, that Jesus, this way of Jesus, is God. And we would say it like this in big theology, that, that Jesus reveals the eternal, immutable logos of God. The word immutable means unchanging. It can't mutate. This is a, a fundamental belief that Christians have held in every century, that God is unchanging, that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what happens is we see visions of God everywhere in our world, but in Jesus we see the true, immutable, eternal one. What God actually is, the Logos. What John says, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. And what happens is the Logos takes on flesh and dwells among us. And what was this Logos? What was this very essence? Right? It was love your enemies. It's a little different than the Amalekites and the Midianites. But God's immutable. God doesn't change. But Jesus reveals God as one who says, love your enemies, who prays, Father, forgive them to those that would crucify him, who tells his followers to pray for those who persecute you. Like, this is it. See, what Jesus reveals is that God is nonviolent, that God is forgiveness, that God is resistance to oppressors, that God is inclusion, that God is grace, that God is distributive justice. This is what Jesus reveals to us, and that's what makes it so beautiful. And that's why Jesus is the framework for understanding all these. Because we can find the Bible verses for them all. But we've been given Jesus to help us interpret and understand how all that works. And so here's the thing I don't want us to miss. Because we have to understand that these two images of God, 
These two visions, these two understandings of God are there for us in the Bible. It does not hide it. It doesn't, it doesn't try to downplay it. They're there. But we have a choice to make as Christians. And here's the choice. Will we choose the, the radical, nonviolent vision of God that's incarnate in Jesus? Or will we choose the Bible's normal, violent vision of God incarnate in civilization? Both are in the Bible. So we have these two choices that the Bible gives us. The Bible at times will give us a vision of the normalcy, what some scholars call the normalcy of civilization, violence, portrayed into God. Or will we choose the radicality of God, which is nonviolent, loving, forgiveness, inclusion? And we see that all throughout the pages of Scripture. We make that choice. See, we always have the choice between Armageddon or the banquet. We always have the choice between the sword of Caesar or the cross of Christ. Now, this isn't like the choice between like an, one of the oldest heresies of like, well, there's this God in the Old Testament that Jesus came and conquered. So there's two different gods. That's not what we're saying. We're saying there's two different visions of God, and there always is two different visions of God in this world, and the Bible reflects that deep reality. And we read the Bible making the choice to put our faith in Jesus and saying, this is the beloved Son in whom God is pleased. Listen to Him. <laughs> Don't listen to Moses. Don't listen to Elijah. Don't, li don't listen. Like, I'm there in all of that, uh, breaking through, but it's Jesus. And so tomorrow, as a follower of Jesus, as a person who's trying to live this ethic of love and grace in our lives, what does that mean for tomorrow? Well, many of us are going to read our Bibles. That's wonderful. I want to encourage you to read your Bible looking for the assertions and the subversions of God of Jesus's path to peace. That as we read these scriptures, as we look at them, we're constantly saying, is this an assertion of the radicality of God? Breaking into culture, breaking into human understanding of the world, breaking into the way of violence, breaking into the, the thought that says, well, we get the Roman thought that says we get you know, peace through victory. And the Jesus way that says, no, 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 you get peace through justice. <laughs> like there's a, it's just a different program. And so we read the Bible looking for both of these, and we also read with an understanding that every, every time we talk about God, it's a metaphor. And so this concept of the wrath of God, we need to understand it as a biblical metaphor. It's grounded in the books of the Bible. It's grounded in a time and place, but it's referring to the natural consequences of going against the grain of love, what one author says, the grain of love. When I live my life and I go against the grain of love, I experience what the Bible would call the wrath of God, what I would tell my children are consequences for being mean. <laughs> this is what happens when you're mean. This is what happens when you're selfish. This is what happens when you don't think about your neighbor. I would never tell my children. I hope you would never tell them, well, God's just going to get you. You told a lie. God's going to get you. No, like there's a natural consequence. You told a lie. I don't trust you. Maybe not one lie. Maybe until 25, right? So we see this great in, in Psalm 7, 12 through 16. The first three verses are the metaphor. The second three verses are kind of the enlightened version of this is what's happening. Look what it says. It says, God is a just judge, metaphor, powerful and patient, not exercising anger every day. If one does not repent, God sharpens his sword, strings and readies the bow, prepares his deadly shafts, makes arrows, blazing thunderbolts. Metaphor. <laughs> metaphor for a deep reality but not a description of God in actuality. Because here's the next three verses. Look what it says. Consider how one conceives iniquity, is pregnant with mischief, and gives birth to deception. He digs a hole and bores it deep, but he falls into the pit he has made. His malice turns back upon his head. His violence falls on his own skull. It's right there, right next. It's a beautiful illustration of this idea of metaphor. And, 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 and when you're in a culture where everything is the gods, you, that's just how you think about it. So is there something that the Bible calls the wrath of God that we would call natural consequence? Absolutely. And just because it's a metaphor, that doesn't mean that the consequences are no less real or painful. But it's, it is important that we recognize it's not this divine being that's zap, you know? Because here's the really difficult shift for folks like me that grew up in the, 
in that massive <laughs> implosion of end times, God sitting on a throne getting ready to judge you, is that I've come to this deep conclusion that there is a danger when we talk about God as a being versus God as being, okay? And this is tricky, but there's something dangerous when I say God loves versus God is love. There's something right about that metaphor that God loves, right? I'm not saying that God doesn't love, but when I say God is just, that's different than saying God is justice, right? God, and that's the logos. That's what I mean. That's the eternal logos that is, I think, coursing through the fabric of our universe, that, that it's producing life and guiding. And, and so there is this reality that God is love, that God is justice, that God is grace, that God is forgiveness. This is the logos, the divine logos. But here's the thing. Here's the beauty of it. That being, that existence, that thing that is beyond all took on flesh and became a human being in the person of Jesus, a reflection of that in its most truest form as a human being. And that's healthy and safe. And now because of that, I, I don't have to be afraid of retiring metaphors that become unhealthy and dangerous. We just become more and more violent. We see it all around us. It's televised. This idea of wrath of God that now I get to say, I am the wrath of God. I'm the tip of the spear. I believe right. I get to do this stuff. It's dangerous. Uh, metaphors about an army of God, dangerous right now. We can now, it, I mean, we can end our planet with, like with three buttons. Like, it's time that we get rid of some of these metaphors about God. As we wrap up here, um, which believe it or not, I've gone shorter than last service, but <laughs> in 1999, there was a, a scholar, a New Testament scholar named John Dominic Crossan, and uh, Crossan was giving a lecture in California. He was, a, he was really seminal in the, the Jesus seminar, the, the, the work on the historical Jesus, a Christian whose faith is really grounded in nonviolent historical Jesus. And he said this, and this is important for this topic. He said, the age of enlightenment has been replaced by the age of entertainment. So the age of enlightenment has been replaced by the age of entertainment. Now, what was the major conflict within the age of enlightenment? It was the conflict between science and religion, right? We're moving out of having to see everything as first order God into understanding science, helping us understand how God is working in our world. So he says this, this is what he says, is the future clash will not be between science and religion, but between both of them and fantasy. This is 1999. Remember what's happening with all of the end time stuff, all the rhetoric in our uh, foreign policy around Armageddon and, and being chosen by God, like all of that stuff. And he says, what I'm trying to imagine is what Christianity must do to clearly and honestly distinguish itself from fantasy. He says, if it does not do that, if Christianity doesn't do that, it will certainly survive, but only as an important and even lucrative subdivision of worldwide entertainment and global illusion. If Christianity can't figure out how to say, what of it is real and true and affecting change in this world, and what of it is fantasy of raptures and people on horses coming out of the sky, if we can't do that, we will just, Christianity is just going to become a major global illusion and it's going to become part of this worldwide entertainment. He says that in 1999. And what happens? In the year 2000, the first of six Left Behind trilogy movies come out and that really sparks now interest. Book sales go up. Everybody starts digging in. 9-11 happens. We now have the rhetoric of God has put me in charge, me in place. What's happening in the Middle East? These are the signs of the times, all this end time. It, and we're moving into fantasy. It's faith-based fantasy, but it's fantasy nonetheless. There's a Bible verse for it, but it's fantasy that produces evil and harm and violence and affects lives, real lives. So he says he has two bins, and this is what I would encourage us to do, is to create two bins for inputs that come into our lives. Okay, so imagine you have two bins, two, two like storage bins, and, and we're all bombarded with inputs that deal with like our spiritual lives and church and faith and the Bible and all kinds of stuff. And he says there's two bins. One is the bin of unconcern and one is the bin of disbelief, right? So the bin of unconcern is where we put that stuff that we go, I just, I can't take any time to worry about it. <laughs> I've got too much, I have to put all my energy and focus on the bin of what I will disbelieve, that I will work against, that I will be anti. 
and, and if I get lost in these things. So I just have to put him in the bin of unconcern and let him go. And so in the bin of unconcern, he talks about things like magical powers, conspiracy theories, alien abductions, just not going to waste any of my Christian energy on it. I, you know, for me, I would say things like, I'm not going to argue with you about Harry Potter. Like, whatever, read it. It's, it's it, whatever. I'm not, it, it's not going to spend any time on that. I'm not going to spend any time on how a person should be baptized. You want to be sprinkled? You want to be dunked? You want me to hold a garden hose over your face? What? what? I don't really care. I don't think Jesus cares. I think it's an ancient symbol of something. I, I honestly wonder sometimes if Jesus would be like, I can't believe you guys are still baptizing people. That's so weird. Nobody does that anymore. Like sometimes I wonder if Jesus would say stuff like that. And I know that really is frightening, and I'll still baptize people, and I think it's powerful, but I just, like, how we do that, I don't care. How we sing, what songs we sing, you know, eh, whatever, lights, fog, pews, chairs, how you should dress going to church, I just, that, eh, whatever. I was going, those go in my bin of unconcern. But he says, the bin of disbelief is where we put those things that we relentlessly oppose as a Christian, as a person who is living for Jesus' program on this world, in this world. He says things like discrimination and oppression and homophobia and patriarchy and injustice and violence and force and empire, those have to get put into the bin of disbelief. They have, and we have to use our effort and our energy to present God's vision for the world of justice, of nonviolent resistance, of grace and inclusion. So the question becomes, the violent God, right, the violent God of judgment and wrath, all of this stuff that gets up, all this stuff that's out there about the end times and the Left Behind series, all those things, the things that people want to come up to me and say, I watch the show and they talk about it and they say, this is what's happening and look at this person, this person's now the Antichrist and this person's the prophet and this person is the beast. Where do I put all that? Does that go in the bin of unconcern, like, oh my gosh, it's fantasy, or does it go in the bin of disbelief? Where does it go? And I would agree wholeheartedly with Crossan that it has to go in the bin of disbelief. It has to, because there's too much at stake in that fantasy. Why? Because a violent vision of God leads to a violent people of God. And so we have to say emphatically, that is not who God is. That is not the nature of God. Yes, we are shown these two visions of God, but what God is truly like is seen in the person of Jesus because a violent vision of God leads to a violent people of God. And so I did a little Googling this week of sermon series that are out there in our churches in America. This is one, Combat Faith. We have a picture of a soldier armed going out. Let's study Second Peter. I found these four, all one, one company that will brand this sermon series for our churches. The Way of the Warrior. Here's a sword ready to be swung. Where are the warriors? Spiritual warfare with knights and armor. Choose your weapon. One I thought was the most vile antichrist image for a sermon series with a gun and bullets. Choose your weapon. One, a warrior in the image of my father, like a Roman centurion almost. The armor of God. I was sitting there yesterday and uh, I was scrolling through my phone, you know, doing like what we all do, a lull on a TV show or whatever. And, and there was a person I know who's a pastor who they posted a song on their Facebook feed. I'd never heard of the song, but the title of the song got me thinking because of the topic. And the title of the song was called um, God and a Gun. I think that was the title of the song. So I looked up the lyrics. I said, I got to find out. There's a link to it. So I linked to it. And this is the lyric of the song. Uh, so this is the chorus. So say what you want to about the things I hold true and the fabric that makes up this red, white, and blue because I'll fight for my country till the day that I'm done. I've still got my God and I've still got my gun. Here's verse two. Uh, I was raised up to stand up for what I thought was right, a tooth for a tooth and an eye for an eye and do unto others as you'd be done to if you do me wrong, mister, got it coming to you. I've still got my God, I've still got my gun. Like it matters. <laughs> it matters. How about this one? My feeling as a Christian points me to my Lord and Savior as a fighter. It points me to the man who once, in loneliness, surrounded only by a few followers, recognized these Jews for what they were and summoned men to fight against them, and who God's truth was greatest, not as a sufferer, but as a fighter. 
in boundless love as a Christian and as a man, I read through the passage which tells us how the Lord at last rose in his might and seized the scourge to drive out of the temple the brood of vipers. How terrific was his fight for the world against the Jewish poison. Today, after 2,000 years with deepest emotion, I recognize more profoundly than ever before the fact that it was for this that he had to shed his blood upon the cross. As a Christian, I have no duty to allow myself to be cheated, but I have the duty to be a fighter for truth and justice. Adolf Hitler. It matters. Whatever happened to beating our swords into plowshares, the great vision of Scripture, the great assertion of God. So how does this idea of reading Scripture, of, of saying, yes, we are given a vision of God, but it is... It is, it is completely overthrown by the person of Jesus, and we now have to interpret and read Scripture through this lens and know where we got it wrong within the Bible about God and where Jesus shows us we get it right, where it happens even beyond post-Jesus, our natural tendency to go back into what is normal for civilization. How does this bring God's vision closer to our What will happen? Here's what I think could happen. We might not destroy ourselves in the name of God and Armageddon. Like, we just might, as a species, avoid nuclear holocaust. If we can't get this image as Christians of the nonviolent resistance of Jesus, of the inclusion of Jesus, of the grace of God that is beyond our understanding, eventually the button will be pushed and we'll do it in the name of God. But if we can get this and if we can be brave enough to say, no, this this image, this way of describing God, even in our sacred text is wrong. And that's what makes our, tes- our text sacred because they show us where our tendency is to put God into our image. But Jesus shows us that has nothing to do with God. You say, well, that's really nice, Ryan. Save the planet. I mean, I got to go to work tomorrow. <laughs> I got my kids. Okay, we might save our families from a love that keeps a record of wrong. You probably know the story. Maybe you've done it. Maybe you've been a recipient of it. But there was, is and was a phenomenon within Christian families of the disowning of children because of the choices they make in life, because of the way they are, because of their sexuality, because of, of their economics, because of whatever, because of some decision they made. There's this, there's this belief that I can just disown my children. Where does that come from? It comes from a belief that God will eventually disown you if you're bad enough. If you live an unrepentant enough lifestyle, God will eventually cast you out of God's presence. And so this is the most loving thing I can do. This is what I'm called to do. And it's destroying families. And we say, no, no, it's, it, you know, what's really destroying the American families is the idea of baking a cake for a gay couple. Give me a break. It's, the, it, it, it's just, in, it, it's manipulative religious insanity in my opinion. That's, dist- no. We, we, will, we will disown our own children for some some moral standard that we aren't even sure where it. So it matters for our families and it matters for our churches because I actually believe if we get this vision, religion itself might start organizing around something that actually matters. Peacemaking. I believe what we're doing here is invaluable because it is the very heart of the father. It's what Jesus wants to be done in this earth as in heaven on earth. It's collaborative. It's the work And we can do that and we can trust and not have to worry about this violent God because of what Jesus says. So what is God inviting you into today? As we wrap up, I know I said that 10 minutes ago, but here's the truth. Leave FBI God and spirituality, find healing from fear and anxiety. And that is a difficult process. It's a blinding process. When you've been ingrained like I was and engrafted in this idea that one day in the twinkling of an eye, it could all end are you ready? You live your life in constant fear and anxiety, and that has nothing to do with the way of Jesus. But it is a, it is a journey away and out of that spirituality that is so difficult. It's going to be like what your experience is when you walk out of this room where all the blinds are closed, and you walk out, and it hurts like the light from the atrium because it's so sunny outside. And what do you want to do? You want to just go back into the dark room. But what you have to do is just stay and suffer through the transition a little bit. So maybe God's inviting you to start reading the Bible with a set of eyes to see these two visions, the radicality of God, 
the normalcy of civilization and own it and say, that's what's happening here. And be grateful that that's what we're given because we can see ourselves in it. And maybe this is like a whole lot for you and you're like, what do I do? Well, um, if you check that box that talks about, I have a list of books and resources, some podcasts that if you want to like listen and just begin to explore that might help you overcome a fear of FBI God, like you really are like, this makes so much sense to me, but I don't know where to go. I've always thought this didn't make sense. It's always been hard for me, the violence. And I have some, I think, resources that you might want to thumb through. Just check that box. We'll email them to you here today. And then you can just kind of work through that. But I hope all of us experience this, the vision of God incarnate in Jesus that really is just too good to be true. And we can sing that it's not too good to be true, but it is. I mean, it is just too good to be true because it's just so hard for our framework to get. But that's the invitation I think God wants for us. So take about two minutes finish filling out that connect card, enjoy a reprise of this song, listen to it with maybe a fresh set of ears, and I'll be back to speak a blessing over you and get you out of here finally. receive a blessing. Uh, if you're uh, tuning in online or you're in the room, you'd like to pray with somebody, we'll have some folks up here that would love to pray with you if you're in the room. If you're tuning in online, you can text the word prayer to 970-500-0970 or click that live prayer link and someone would be happy to pray with you. Um, it was about 10 minutes shorter on Thursday night, so there's a plug for coming on Thursday nights, I guess. But thank you for your patience. It's a big topic. Um, and if you are a guest, so glad you were here today to get to hear think what is the heart of our church for a healthy spirituality and understanding of God in this world. Um, and uh, thanks for waking up and standing up with us, everybody. So do me a favor, just uh, raise your hands a little bit. Receive our blessing today. May God bless you and keep you. May love cause its light to shine upon you. And may the Spirit of God release you from violent and dangerous images of the divine so that you might find peace and a path to healing. And may you have eyes to see the tensions within the Bible. And may you trust that the mind of Christ that has been given to you, may you trust that. And may you burn the ships that sail on the winds of a violent and retributive God. May you never imagine a Jesus whose victory comes in any way other than his own death and resurrection. And may you trust that the healing of the nations begins with the healing of your fear of a wrathful, retributive God. May you find rest in the radical vision of God, the immutable Logos made incarnate in Christ Jesus. And may your confidence this week be rooted in the divine love that keeps no record of wrong. You are loved, you are forgiven, you are free, and it is not too good to be true. Amen. Have a great week, everybody.